Okay, guys, so this is sort of the second half of our lecture where we are looking at another example of formal analysis and continuing to think about the importance of formal analysis so that you can complete your um, assignment. So the first part of the assignment is to sort of um, give a recap of what I'm going to be talking about and as well as some of the things that I ask you to do um, in the lecture. And then the second half um, will be to complete that formal analysis on your own. Okay, so in class on Tuesday, um, we talked about Kahinda Wiley and discussed sort of his um, importance in art and art history and really thinking about um, the importance of his work for the black community um, in putting sort of black uh, men and women in the seats of power in classical imagery. And it's very important today as he's sort of worked very hard to um, encourage black representation in museums that have otherwise not had um, black men and women as main subject matter um, and him putting them in these sort of classic large history paintings um, such as Napoleon leading the army over the Alps which um, we will be talking about in class and he's really sort of reflecting again um, on Jacques-Louis David's Napoleon Crossing the Alps from 1801 um, in playing with this very famous historical painting um, and placing black men and women in those positions of power that have often um, not been reserved for them. He's also kind of played with um, some other things as well. This picture's a little blurrier than I would like. But um, in the background, he is also, in this painting in particular, painted sperm as kind of a joke um, to the sort of masculinity that is promoted in paintings like this, this sort of um, outdated construct of masculinity. Um, he's kind of toying with it by putting little sperm in the background that you don't really see. Um, but here is the painting in the museum and some other works we talked about as well. And like we talked about in class, Kendall Wiley is very much so producing paintings that reflect um, these historical narratives in more than one work, so not just Napoleon crossing the Alps, um, but in a lot of sort of different paintings and images as well. Um, so this one in particular, reflecting on Van Eyck, um, and these are all from the Blacklight series that he created. Um, here's actor Sir Anthony Van Dyck. And these works we talked about as well. Um, revolving around uh, Tahiti, which I'm going to skip here for now. So we're going to do another example of formal analysis here, and I want you to look at these um, next paintings by John Singer Sargent. They're two sets of portraits, so two different paintings. They're not related to each other, except that they're by John Singer Sargent. And I want you to write down to some sort of formal elements using those formal worksheets again, um, to really look at them and engage with them. So write down um, maybe about five things or so about each work, so 10 kind of total if you can um, think of that many for each one, and include that in um, your response uh, due next Tuesday as well. So um, go ahead and do that. I'm going to show some pictures here of the paintings and then we will watch the video and then I will talk about these paintings further.
And here's the second painting. I am going to play this video now. Um, this is part of the Met series, um, which kind of interviews artists on the collection at the Met um, and has them talk about different works. Um, so this is Hendel Wiley talking about um, John Singer Sargent in particular. So I'm going to play that here. My name is Gehinde Wiley. I make paintings, portraits primarily, of young African American men and women. My work in Sargent intersects with some of the problematics surrounding class. In his day, he was commissioned to make portraits by some of the most celebrated families in the world. I'm a young black man trying to deal with the ways in which colonialism and empire are all in these pictures, but they're fabulous. It's a guilty pleasure. The seduction is there. Sargent is probably one of the best painters I know because he's able to make it look so effortless. You have a table, the master stroke is a highlight. What's little known is that Sargent would make that master stroke and if it wasn't just quite right, he'd wipe it off. Let's not doubt that these are high-priced luxury goods for wealthy consumers. We look at these amazing sisters in the foreground, but what we also see in the background is a family portrait that points back to the history. And so it's about painting convincing us about our undeniable place in the world. There's a power relationship here. You're standing in front of this gorgeous woman at this insanely large scale. Where would you be if you were in that room? You're on your knees. All of these paintings were incredibly important social occasions. And so you get the best gowns made. You have your hair done to the nines. The powdered faces and the pearls and all of that regalia becomes part of this grand show. These people have been preparing their entire lives for this moment. And here it is. If you look at the eyes, there's a desire to please the artist himself, as opposed to correcting for that sergeant paints the performance. The volume's turned up too high on so much of this stuff, to the point where we can almost recognize the absurdity of it. Generally, I enjoy painting the powerless much more than the powerful. My relationship with the art industrial complex is, is a very troubled one. Many of the people who are in my paintings can't afford my painting. There's a conundrum there. I try to establish a kind of cold neutrality. The cruel indifference of history itself has to be echoed in the enterprise of painting. The strange history in which so many people who are black and brown don't happen to people the great museums throughout the world. My work is not about opining. It's not about looking at the past and longing for that to be something different. I'm interested in using the past in order to break open into the present day. So many people will look at a simple portrait like this and say, you're making so much out of nothing. And I disagree. I think that there is a universe being pointed to here. It's something that you can see if you're interested in looking that way. So what we have going on in this, right, is Kahinda Wiley is thinking about these paintings and sort of it's the historical narrative that kind of comes along with them. And this is a big part of um, being an art historian, right, thinking about not only the formal elements of the work, right, the brush strokes and the way that John Singer Sargent paints, right, which is very important um, and very interesting. You see the development of painting style in the John Singer Sargent has this very 
particular way that he uses lines, right, and brush strokes. Everything um, seems very sharp and um, sort of clear and organized until you get up close to the painting, right? And you see these tiny brush strokes that he's used. And so that even this string of pearls on her necklace is not um, highly defined, but because he's created this little highlight on each pearl, um, you really get the sense of what he's depicting here. Um, and Kahindawali is referencing so many important ideas in this video um, surrounding sort of the class um, that are depicted in these paintings, right? This sort of monumental event and these women are, um, in particular, so these sisters that are being painted probably before they're married or um, shortly after when they're quite young still, showing them in this great room with paintings in the background, right? Showing their wealth and their power um, and sort of their placement in the world. And John Singer Sargent was able to sort of capture the sort of emotional intensity of paintings as well, of, of the sitters, that is, um, in the use of his brush strokes and his movement, right? I mean, it's just intensely gorgeous the way that he's able to paint these things um, very much like Kinda Wiley says, with such sort of effortlessness. And even in this painting of Madame X, who is someone that John Singer Sargent um, painted uh, because he wanted to paint her. He uh, requested that he could paint her um, in particular. And he emphasized her daring personal style, showing um, this really sort of very sexual, gorgeous gown, right? This is the 1800s, right? Um, this would have been quite scandalous um, for the day. And then showing her in this very sort of simple setting with just this table, um, to show us our depth and uh, wealth as well, but mostly focus on sort of the paleness of her skin and the drapery in her dress and the gold highlights on the metal as well. And this painting was quite um, controversial at the time because when he originally painted it, sorry that this image is a little pixelated, but um, you can see here how um, John Singer Sargent originally painted it with her strap down, actually. So this sort of very sexually alluring um, moment here. And the Academy thought it was quite scandalous. So he ended up um, painting it up on her shoulder. But like Handa Wiley talks about this idea of seduction and effortlessness and this performance that these um, individual women are putting on, whether or not it's to sort of show their power and wealth or um, to show their availability for marriage, um, etc. So, um, Wiley talks about all these important things because he talks about wanting to represent people who are not represented, right? So that goes back to his speech and um, or his little sort of video here and then his work as a whole um, and talks about how the people he paints can't afford the paintings that he creates, right? Um, and there's a sort of ironic nature to that as well. Um, but it's also about representing um, BIPOC people in historic paintings. Um, and Kahinda Wiley does this with these very large, massive historical paintings um, representing Black figures. So very much reflects on sort of the Guerrilla Girls. Hopefully you know who they are um, a little bit and their sort of importance in art historical dialogue as well um, in trying to get more women um, represented in museums as a whole and not just being in the nude or sort of these frilly portraitures, um, but in sort of these grand historical narratives as well. So a big part of art history and thinking about yourself as an art historian, whether or not you sort of think that, um, I don't remember, I don't know if you guys remember these memes that went around, um, I don't know when, maybe like five years ago or something that said, um, what my friends think I do, what my parents think I do, et cetera. Um, but really we're going to talk about what, what do art historians do, right? At large. So historically, um, art historians were sort of simple formal analysis writers. They would write sort of a formal analysis of a painting or a sculpture, 
um, and then kind of describe what an artwork is worth. So Erwin Panofsky is really one of the most famous early art historians um, and really sort of sets the precedent for that. Um, I know he's very attractive with that um, collar he has. But um, as time has moved on and we've moved into the 21st century, we've become more um, involved in thinking critically as well as formally about works. So we need to be studying works in not only their historical um, and in cultural contexts, uh, but also with their formal elements as well. So combining these ideas together. So how we understand humanity through art um, and why that is important. And you can even look back at sort of old art historians and see sort of the inherent mistakes that they've made that have kind of um, moved through our historical dialogues at, a, at large. So um, Vasari was a very famous uh, critic and um, writer about the Renaissance period, very much kind of being obsessed with Michelangelo in particular. And he really developed this idea of... Um, the genius that Michelangelo was this inherent genius that he had this ability he was born with he was born to be an artist he had this power um, as an artist and that genius that um, Michelangelo had is in artists as a whole and it became part of this large dialogue about art history and about artists right that you had to have some sort of inherent genius in you to be able to be an artist right you didn't have to work hard at it you didn't have to study necessarily it was about this sort of inner biological, um, I don't know, part of your DNA that made you able to create art, um, which is not true. And so when we thought, when we used the genius in this sort of art historical dialogues in the past, when people use these, um, they use them to promote white men um, and to encourage white male artists um, and to say that there weren't great women artists because women didn't produce art um, in the same sort of larger scale um, as white men, and that was also true for anyone who wasn't white. Um, so what we of course know though is that there isn't some sort of inherent biological thing, although obviously some people are born um, with certain proclivities, I suppose. There is this sort of nature nurture where white men are encouraged to take up painting, are encouraged by um, their fathers or their society or whatever, um, and then they're put into these apprenticeships. So they have the ability to go out there and to get these jobs and to work on their craft in the way that women and BIPOC men and women are not able to do. So this inherent idea of genius, which is passed down through art historians um, up until probably the what, like 1970s, even with Jackson Pollock, we're still saying that these things are true. But you have Linda Nochlin and other female scholars coming in and being like, you can't just say that women don't have this biological um, power to be artists. That is not the problem, right? It's these sort of historical constraints um, on artists at large, right? That keep anyone who's not white and male um, from sort of achieving um, art greatness. And you can even see it with all the art historians, right? This, if you look up um, who are some famous art historians, you'll get this sort of list of a bunch of white men, right? So white men encouraging other white men. Um, if you don't see that as a systemic problem, right, you're not seeing this sort of large dialogue about how we understand and contemplate art um, at large. And of course that changes and is still changing today. So when we think about art history versus art appreciation, art appreciation is more of this sort of understanding and knowledge of the universal and timeless qualities that identify all great art. Um, so you can have art appreciation without necessarily knowing a lot um, about a work historically or about the artist, but you can appreciate a piece of art for how great it is, how great the technique is, um, if you like the subject matter, that it catches your interest. So. On the other hand, what we're doing in this class and in art history is the academic study of the history and development of painting, sculpture, and other visual arts. And sort of combining those elements of formal analysis with sort of historical knowledge and um, research to understand an object and idea um, in sort of its larger context, right? In these sort of movements, in the history, 
in the changes from um, mostly male genius artists to um, encouraging more points of view um, in the art historical dialogue, which is important. So that we will talk about that in class, right? This Eurocentrism, this way that art historians have talked about art in the past has been focused on Western art history, um, like Greece, Rome, and Italy. And when talking about non-Western art histories, using words such as primitive or other, uh, we talked about this with um, Gauguin in class. And so it kind of invalidates the power of other countries' art and their um, art making at large. And so, We'll see that in this class. We'll talk about the importance of that um, in looking at sort of African versus um, Roman or Greek sculpture and how sort of historically art historians have talked about those things um, to sort of delegitimize um, one community over another. And so in rewriting, when we rewrote this class, um, focusing art, art history, we're trying to move away from this sort of chronological look um, at Western art history in particular, because it only sort of shows you one point of view, right? Um, which is not necessarily valuable to understanding sort of the globalization of the world um, and seeing other points of view, right? If you're not a white male heterosexual, then you might not relate to sort of just Western um, points of view, right? So in this class, we break down things thematically and think about them um, beyond sort of the classic chronological art history. So we'll keep continuing to think about what um, art historians do. I'm sorry that this is cut off. I can't figure out how to get this the way I want it to look. Whoop. Um, but this says looking at art and design as an art historian and sort of gives you some different ideas. So your first impression, function and purpose, media, formal analysis, and cultural context. So. Um, kind of thinking through each step as you move through a formal analysis. So that's really what your assignment is for next week, which is this formal analysis assignment number one, which will be due by class time next week. Um, and I have put that PDF up on the Moodle and hopefully you guys have. So in this prompt uh, that will be up on the Moodle um, is sort of the overview of your assignment, your formal analysis assignment, which is um, to look at um, two objects in your room, um, apartment, dorm, whatever the case may be, um, to choose one 2D and one 3D work and to sort of go over and formally analyze them. Um, if you need help or a suggestion for an object, you can let me know and I can um, provide some that you guys can formally analyze. Um, I'll pick some random things. Uh, but so that's the second step. The first step is to watch the recorded lecture, which is this right now, um, which I've posted on the Moodle, and then to go through um, and to write sort of this 250 words, which is about a page double spaced, um, giving an overview sort of what the lecture material entails, particularly writing down sort of the formal elements we discussed in looking at these paintings by John Singer Sargent, and then what Kahinda Wiley says about them in his Met video. Um, and to do that as sort of the first step, and you can do that in a separate document or um, a document together with this other half. Um, but then to choose those two physical works, um, and then to um, put an image of one of them into the Google Slideshow, which is linked here, and then to submit it by 11.30 a.m. on um, the day we have class, so Friday, January 22nd, because we're going to discuss them in class. So let me know if you have any questions or concerns. Um, otherwise, we'll probably um, sort of go over it in further detail in class as well. Um, but otherwise, good luck. Let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys next week.